So um, I'm going to continue the discussion that I initiated in the introduction yesterday, where I talked about these different operability issues associated with operating gas turbines. By the way, I thought yesterday's presentation from Sokolo, that was just such a great integration of things I talked about. Um, you know, gives you a little bit, so some of the, the graphs that he showed were, were uh, particularly related to gas turbines were a little bit dated uh, because there's actually a big build up, build up boom going on right now with gas turbines because of, because of shale gas. But still, some of the general points that he made I thought really integrated well. And, uh, and, and one point I just want to emphasize there is, is that the, some of the points he was making about the, the wedges with uh, um, using renewables is, is that you don't, don't think that renewables displace gas turbines. Renewables are motivating more interest in gas turbines because you, gotta, you have to have something to back up the, the grid when a cloud goes over a PV array or when the wind stops blowing. And so you know, I just chaired a session. There's a big gas turbine conference last week. And I chaired a session called Operational Flexibility. And the whole point of that session was to talk about issues about making gas, dealing with the combustion challenges associated with making gas turbines not just run at a constant power for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but where gas turbines are swinging power up and down and they're having to do all kinds of things to stabilize the grid and, and deal with increased renewables coming onto the grid. Okay, so um, anyway, so what I, uh, I want to spend about two hours on this bullet today and um, I'm going to talk about the issue of combustion stabilities. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm first going to spend a few minutes motivating combustion instabilities. I think it should be kind of a fun thing because I'll show you a bunch of movies um, of, of what instabilities are and why they're there. Then I want to talk a little bit about combustion instabilities are basically disturbances in combustion. They're basically um, acoustic waves propagating around and they're also manifested by entropy waves and vorticity waves. So I want to give you a general primer on uh, the linearized and average Stokes equation. Some of you may never have actually linearized and average Stokes equations. And talk about disturbances in general and how disturbances propagate in different types of disturbance modes. How many of you have had an acoustics class in your life? Okay, good. Because I added this third bullet anticipating that answer. So I, in order to understand instabilities, you have to have a little bit of an acoustics background. So I'm going to give you a crash eight slide background on acoustics that you need in order to understand this next bullet, which is understanding what happens when you add unsteady heat release, which is sensitive to disturbance, and you stuff that into your wave equation. And your wave equation is the source term. What happens there? Um, OK. So what are combustion instabilities? Um, combustion instabilities are large amplitude oscillations, which are driven by heat release oscillations. And so what I have here is a, um, a little cartoon where you have a flame, and a flame makes heat release, right? So you have reactants going into a flame, and they expand, and they make products. Well, when the rate of heat release oscillates, the rate at which reactants are turned into products oscillates. And because of that expansion, because when, product reactants, go through, when reactants go through flames, they expand, that means that the flame is like a big woofer, a big speaker, a bass speaker. Think about a big speaker. How does it make sound? It just pushes air out of the way. That's all it's got. That, you can see that big cone in the diaphragm is just pushing air out of the way. That's, that's called a monopole sound source. And that's, that's basically what a flame is doing. Stuff is flowing through the flame, and the rate at which it's flowing through the flame is oscillating. Um, and so you get these heat release oscillations, and those make sound. Um, but that sound doesn't just go away. You know, if you, if you listen to your campfire out in the open in the great outdoors, you don't have combustion instabilities because when your campfire makes sound, the sound just propagates away and it's gone. In a combustion chamber, it's a confined environment. These sound waves reflect off the surface and they come back. And flames, as I'll show you, are sensitive to these flow disturbances. If you disturb a flame, it will um, make the heat release oscillate. And so you basically close this feedback loop. Um, there's actually, a, so for those who work in this field, thermoacoustics, there's a, a um, thermoacoustics, by the way, is the word for interactions of heat and sound. Uh, but there's a famous quote from a person in the 1700s who was at some fancy party where they had a, um, a string section and they had some gap, some, uh, some uh, torches. And the, and, the, and the guy made the comment that when the, when the really deep uh, know, bass, I guess it was a bass, was playing, the flame, he said a deaf person could have heard the bass play because the flame was just dancing in time with the music. 
And it just goes to the fact that flames are very sensitive to disturbance, and I'll show you some movies. Um, what I just, what, what, what I was showing you here, this is a, a, a movie. Uh, this is actually an ignition transient. Uh, this is done by my colleague Suresh Menon. It's an LES simulation. But what you're looking at is a pressure isocontour. Flow is going left to right. This is actually an annular combustion chamber. So if you take an annulus and you take a slice through it, that's what it looks like. These are fuel nozzles coming in. And you saw, and you could see those disturbances propagating away. Those are sound waves made by unsteady heat release. So that shows you this leg right here of the feedback loop. Um, and now, these oscillations which occur, they don't happen just at any frequency. They're a very narrow band phenomenon. When you, as I'll, sh I'll show you some spectra of combustion instabilities. They're just discrete peaks in the, in the, in the, in the spectra. And these, these peaks are associated with natural frequencies under a combustion chamber. Just like an organ pipe, you blow air through it. It's got a, a fundamental natural frequency. It actually all has also all kinds of higher overtones as well. Um, but all those natural frequencies are also present in combustion chambers, and those get excited. All right, so this is an experiment you can all try it this evening um, to demonstrate this point. Uh, here I have a, a bottle, and my friend Robert Mihata, who makes, um, he works for a company called Alta Solutions, and they make combustion dynamics monitoring systems. They make hardened systems to measure acoustic oscillations in combustion chambers. Um, I, just to demonstrate what they were trying to do, he just blew across this beer bottle, and here's the spectrum, all right? So this is frequency in hertz, and this is the amplitude of spectrum. So you see these discrete peaks. These discrete peaks are the natural frequency of this bottle. So the lowest frequency right here, 190 hertz, that's what we call the Helmholtz mode. All right, whenever you have a jug where, where you have a volume that's constrained by a neck, like a milk jug or a beer bottle or anything else like that, it's, a, it's what we call a Helmholtz resonator. It has a natural frequency. And it's a lower frequency mode, in, in this case, because this, this bottle is relatively small, it's about 190 hertz. Um, then what it has is there are also modes which swing, which bounce back and forth longitudinally. We call those longitudinal modes. And you can see those two peaks here as well. One there, one there. You also have modes that bounce back and forth this way. All right? And because this radial dimension is smaller, it doesn't take as long for waves to go bang, bang, back and forth. Those are higher frequencies. The period is shorter. The natural frequency is one over the period. And so you can also see these smaller peaks out here and even farther out. And those are the transfer. So same thing's happening in a combustion chamber. All right, so as I mentioned, the key problem is that flames are sensitive to acoustic waves. And this is a movie, um, which is not linking. OK, so this is a fun little movie making the point on just a simple toy flame. Take a Bunsen flame. All right, gas, so this is a Bunsen burner exit. This is a color Schmitter image. Flow's going up. What they basically did was, at the bottom where the, the, the reactants are coming in, they put in a T and they bolted the speaker to the bottom. And then they just turned, plugged the speaker into a function generator. All right? And look what happens. If, if they turn that function generator off, you basically have just a, a nice Bunsen flame. But rather, what you see is this right here is the flame. Does anybody know what this is right here? Pardon? No, this is a lean premix flame. Is that the No, this is this is the hot wake. So this is not a non-reacting interface, but this is this is a Schlieren image. So wherever you see a density interface. So this right here is the flame. There is no flame here, but the hot products are going up, and so here you're just seeing where the, the ambient air is coming into contact with the hot products. So notice a couple things about this picture. Um, it's very clear that you have these wrinkles which are created on the flame. They're, they're convecting downstream. And actually, I'm going to spend the last hour of today talking in detail about these space-time dynamics. You're going to really understand well why it's doing this. But all I want you to know for now is just notice that this flame is not sitting still. It is sensitive to these disturbances. What you can also see is, is if you look at this interface here, notice that the volume of, so that's basically the product, sorry. That's, just combining there as product. Notice that the volume of product is oscillating. This goes back to this monopole base speaker woofer type argument I was making. Notice how the product volume is oscillating in time. This is going to the fact that the amount of reactants being consumed by this flame is oscillating in time. It's not constant. The rate at which reactants are getting expanded out, converting into products, is varying in time. So you can clearly see that by the, um, the, the, the um, whatever you call that thing, the plume, oscillating. 
So flames are sensitive to acoustic waves. So this is part, this is one key part of the problem. So if, if you have a disturbance around the flames, you're going to oscillate. Yes, sir. So here, uh, you're actually preparing the flow. Is it true? You have the reactor flow instead of the flame itself. Uh, yeah, so, so when I say the flame is sensitive to disturbances, I mean that if you have a disturbance in the flow, the flame is going to respond. So you have an oscillation in flow, which gives you a heat release oscillation, which makes sound, which gives you another oscillation in the flow. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the fundamental source of disturbance is, is oftentimes a flow oscillation, or sometimes it can be an oscillation in fuel aeration or stoichiometry of the mixture. Okay, so now, um, so that's, that's one, one reason. The other issue is that actually not only are flames sensitive to acoustic waves, but so is the entire combustion system. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. But one thing about acoustic waves is as long as your flow is subsonic, all right, and these are not scramjets we're talking about. These are, these are gas turbine combustors. Your Mach numbers are well below 0 0.1. So com acoustic waves go pretty much anywhere. All right, they'll go anywhere. And they can, they can go into your fuel. They'll, they'll go into where the air is coming. They're going to they're go into your fuel supply system, and they're going to cause the fuel, the fuel supply rate to oscillate. So, so watch this fun video making this point. Um, you guys can't hear this, can you? How do I make the uh, volume on my thing? Oh my. Yeah, that, that, that's one way. But I, there's a more, there's a more uh, natural way that they showed me yesterday, which I've forgotten. download this on, on YouTube. <laughs> Alright. Well, we can fix this problem. Can we just turn that on? Let me just pause for just one minute to tell you what you're seeing. Um, so there's, a, there's an acoustic standing wave. So I, we'll talk about that later. Uh, and what's happening right here is, is that there are locations where the pressure is oscillating with a, with a high magnitude, and there's locations where the pressure is not oscillating at all. You get nodes and antinodes. And so at this location, and at this location, and at this location, you have a high oscillation pressure. So basically, you get a large oscillatory pressure drop across these holes, and you get a lot of gas flow. Um, and so you see a tall flame. Um, what's happening here is there's really no oscillation and pressure drop, so the flame's really not oscillating that much. Um, and so notice that the, not only is the flame sensitive to sound, which I showed you in the previous slide, but this, here what I'm trying to emphasize is the system, the combustor system, that the flow rate of fuel is going to oscillate in response to these acoustic disturbances.
So real quickly, so as I mentioned, there's combustion instabilities as part of this broader field of thermoacoustics, where if you have an unsteady heat source, it makes sound. All right, So the unsteady heat source can be a flame, as in, in, a, in a combustor. But it can be anything else that's unsteady. For example, um, if you have cryogenic piping, you can have self-excited oscillations. This is a problem in, in systems with cryogenic piping. Because what can happen is if you have a very abrupt temperature <coughs> gradient, and you have flow, imagine you have a flow oscillation. If you have a packet of fluid which bounces back and forth between a high and a low temperature region, think about what's happening to it. It goes to the low temperature, it contracts. It goes to the high temperature, it expands. And so that creates an oscillation. You can actually have a system that's self-excited that will spontaneously oscillate. Um, in the same way, there, there's something called a Riki tube, and this is the video that I'm going to show you. If you take, this again is an experiment you can do at home, as you'll see. You take a piece of pipe, and a quarter of the way up, take a hot piece of, uh, take like a, a metal, metal gauze. Basically take something where it's not, a, where air can flow through it, but where you, can, where you can have a lot of metal surface area. If you heat that thing up, it'll just sing on its own. All right? Um, and actually, this is the video I want to show you of the Riki tube. Go to YouTube directly? Yeah, I probably can if I have to, but let me uh, just look one other spot here. I've played this plenty of times. Um,
That's weird. I played that movie so many times on the computer. Well, it's kind of a, it's a fun little movie because what happens is is the uh, this person <coughs> here's this piece of it's an open piece of pipe and there's the hot metal gauze. They place it over the fire over the, the heat source. Then they take it off and you'll hear a whistle. It just oscillates on its own. And then the but the oscillation gradually decays as that heat source cools off. And then they do this other fun little thing where they turn it sideways. It's, it's whistling. They turn it sideways. It stops whistling. And they turn it back up. And basically, what that shows you is buoyancy is playing a role in this in this device. It's, it's, giving, it's drawing the air up through it. And, and again, what's happening is is that as air passes over that gauze, in an oscill as, as it oscillates back and forth across the gauze, it's, it's heating up and cooling off. Monopole sorts of sound. Okay. So uh, what I wanted to do was, um, this is a class on gas turbines, but I thought I would just have a couple quick slides giving you a little bit of context on the instability problem. Because it turns out that combustion instabilities have been one of the key problems facing pretty much every high performance combustion system that's been developed since early days. And, uh, and it continues to be a big issue uh, in many other fields besides gas turbines. But one of the biggest areas it was um, present was in liquid rockets. Uh, the F-1 engine, it's the largest thrust engine ever developed by the United States. It was used on the Saturn V rockets. The thing's huge. It had a huge instability problem. Um, and they did 3,200 full-scale tests on the F-1. Uh, and 2,000 of those, 3,200 were done. Pure trial and error just to test for combustion instabilities. Um, so it was, it was an enormous problem. These tests were enormously expensive. Um, and uh, here is a, here is a photograph of the injector plate of a liquid rocket. So the flow is coming out of the, the screen at you. And all these little holes are holes where they're injecting uh, oxygen, a uh, uh, cryogenic fuel or oxidizer. And uh, the thing I want to point out to you is you see these, these are called baffles. And these actually protrude up out of the injector plate. And their objective is to suppress transverse acoustic motions right in the vicinity of the spray. <coughs> so what was happening was that they, they figured out that, this, that the that these transverse modes were, were interacting with the, with the unsteady spray dynamics, jet impingement dynamics, and giving you the self exciting feedback loop. And they were trying to break that up with those, those baffles. Um, it's also been a big issue with, with afterburners. Um, uh, in particular, flight type devices are very sensitive to, to oscillations just because of light construction. So it's not totally uncommon for to get a screeching instability in an afterburner and then you come back and you land on the aircraft carrier and all the hardware which used to be in the back end of the afterburner is gone. It just got destroyed, it's gone. Um, and uh, let's see, that's another example. Oh, solid, solid rockets is another one. Um, so every time the space shuttle, well, it doesn't take off anymore. When it would take off, there, there was an instability. It was about a two, a one to three PSI oscillation. All right. Now, one to three PSI would probably be unacceptable for a gas turbine because a gas turbine has to operate for thousands of hours. All right. So that type of, of oscillation over that time, well, it does dramatically shorten. But the booster has just got to last for you know a couple of minutes, so that's no problem. Um, what it does do though is it, it causes the thrust obviously to oscillate coming out of that rocket. Um, there is a uh, you know, solid rockets are using a lot of ballistic missiles, so there's a lot of fun stories out there if you talk to people who've tested these about what would happen during a combustion instability. So one, in one test, you know, they had this whole solid rocket bolted down sideways, sitting out in the desert, chained to the test stand. And, and they, after they did the test, they saw all this scoring, and they realized that the whole solid rocket had been rotating. It hadn't shot off, but it had been rotating in the test stand because it, it had these enormous spinning instability, which actually generated so much torque it actually rotated it. Um, something else that can happen is, well, this is a nice uh, illustration of an instability in a solid rocket. And look at these oscillations. These are about 1,000 PSI peak to peak. I mean, these are huge oscillations. Um, and you see what happens. If, if you see that this, uh, the, the time average pressure is rising, and then you get the instability, and the average pressure increases by about 500 PSI. So actually, uh, there's a, it's, unfortunately, they, the, the uh, Air Force wouldn't give me the video, but they have a fun video, again, of them firing a solid rocket out in the, in the desert, and all of a sudden, the rocket's gone. It's like, where'd the rocket go? Well, <laughs> this mean pressure shift also causes a, a mean thrust shift, and it basically, the mean pressure, the instability was big enough to cause the time average pressure to change enough that it over maxed out the capability of the thrust stand, and that 
rock was just liberated out of the desert and took off. Um, anyway, so that is, that's a motivation for instabilities. Okay, now I want to talk about some, I want to dig, dig in a little bit of math, and I want to talk generally about disturbances in the question. All right. How disturbance, what, dis, what disturbances are, how they propagate, how they're amplified, and so forth. Um, and so I want to start by looking at small amplitude propagation and uniform inviscid flows. All right, so um, take the I want to take the navier stokes equations and the energy equation. I want to shut viscosity off in, th in viscous transport. It turns out that to understand this pro the problems I'm going to talk about at high Reynolds numbers, viscous effects and uh, uh, molecular transport effects are negligible. Um, the other thing I want to do, which is a little bit more of a restrictive assumption, but I have to make it in order to get some simple results, is I'm going to assume that I have a spatially homogeneous background flow. So I'm going to assume, if you look at this, I'm going to assume that the pressure, the, the density, the velocity, that there's some time average, and the time average is not varying in space. So I have some mean pressure, which is spatially constant, some mean density, spatially constant. Now, obviously, this is not a great assumption for a combustion chamber, but I'll tell you what happens when due to these effects later when you have inhomogeneities. Um, mean velocity is constant. And what I want to do is I want to decompose each variable into a sum of, a, of this base, basically this average component, which I'm going to use the subscript not for, zero. And then I want to add to it a fluctuating component, which I'm going to give a subscript of one. All right? And so this quantity, these quantities here, by, by my assumptions, they're, they're, they're not functions of time by definition, but, but also because of the assumptions of homogeneity, they're also not functions of space. All right? Now the disturbances are functions of both space and time, and what I want to do is I want to derive some equations describing the space-time dynamics of these disturbances. All right? And what I'm going to do is, well, the, the Navier-Stokes equations are nonlinear and they're a big nasty mess, so we can't, what I want to do is I want to linearize them. How many of you are familiar with the process of linearization of a nonlinear equation? Okay. So, Linearization is a, is a simplification where you basically say, I have, if I have small enough disturbances, okay, I'm just going to jump straight to the linear equation. So let me uh, write, it, write it in uh, an example. So simple example, mass conservation. All right, so I'm gonna, let me expand each variable. The, the row naught doesn't vary in time, so I can right away write this as d rho 1 by dt plus. Okay, so now let's look at this. Rho naught doesn't vary in space, so I can pull that out of the, 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 uh, the uh, divergence operator. And I can then write this as del dot rho 1. Actually, u naught is, is not a function of space either, so I can pull that. Well, let, let's, let me just write them all out. And we'll, Sorry, I'll uh, write my next equation up here. Um, okay, so now what I can do is I can, this term right here, del dot rho naught u naught, that has to equal zero in, in and of itself. So I can write an equation, I can take out the time average piece and I can write an equation just for the perturbations as d rho one by dt plus uh, survive. Let's see. Let's 
Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Now I got them all. Um, so this is describing the, the propagation of a, of a general disturbance. But now, in, when you linearize the equation, you make one crucial step, which is you say, okay, these perturbations are very small relative to the, to the mean, all right? And so I have, I have a perturbation term, a perturbation term, a perturbation term. Here I have a product of two perturbations, right? So let's just say that the perturbation, if I were to normalize this thing, the perturbation amplitude, let's just say, is 1% of the mean, all right? So this term would be of order 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0.01. This term would be of order 0 0.01 squared, so it's going to be very small. All right, so when you linearize, you basically ignore that term. And you, and you end up with a linear, a, a set of an equation. It's a partial differential equation, but it's linear in disturbance amplitude. And as soon as you linearize it, it's so, it's, it's so much simpler. Right? You, can, you can really simplify things a lot. So that's the basic step that we're going to do. And I'm going to jump right to the answer. All right? I'm going to say, if I take the Navier Stokes equations and the energy equation, and I linearize them, and then I clean everything up, what do I end up with? And I'm, and I'm going to write the equations. I'm going to take and I'm going to write three different equations. All right? So I kind of know the answer ahead. And so I'm just going to tell you the answer. There's a lot of intermediate steps. I teach a whole class in combustion dynamics. Well, I fill in all the, the gory details. But basically, you can write these three equations, um, which describe the, the propagation of vorticity disturbances, entropy disturbances, and pressure disturbances. And I'm going to call that the acoustic wave equation. So let me just write out what I, when I say d naught by dt, that operator, just so you know what I'm talking about here. Oh, and, and I'm sorry, omega is the vorticity. So omega, again, you can expand the vorticity of the mean plus the fluctuation. And so this equals the And the entropy and the uh, entropy equation says same thing. And then this is just my private notation for the convective, the convective derivative, uh, the, the substantial derivative. But when I put a subscript not, I'm, the, the convection is only by the mean velocity. pressure equation, it's a little bit more, I'm not going to expand out the, the, the convection term here, but uh, it turns out that unless you have, for, for low Mach number flows, you can approximate this term just by partial, the, well, let me just write it out. Um, I, was being, I was being general when I wrote that equation out, but for low Mach number flows, you can replace that equation by this. C naught is just the speed of sound, square root of gamma on T naught. Okay. So this is this is one way to write the linearized Navier Stokes energy equation. And this is the equation that's useful for, for my purposes. Alright. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce a what I'm going to call a canonical disturbance decomposition. I'm going to say, okay, I have disturbances, but let me assume that fundamental underlying these disturbances are these fundamental disturbance modes, which I'm going to call acoustic modes, vorticity mode, and entropy mode. All right? So I'm going to assume that I have oscillations, that I have disturbances in vorticity, acoustics, and entropy. So vorticity oscillation, I think, should be fairly clear. It's a, it's a vortical fluctuation. Entropy fluctuation is an entropy fluctuation. That's obvious. And an acoustic fluctuation is a dilata dilational, dis dilatational disturbance, or dilational disturbance. Um, depends whether you're from the UK or U.S. whether you say dilatation or dilation. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a fluctuation in volume. So for a perfectly incompressible flow, you don't have fluctuation in volume. Volume is, 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 is fixed. Um, but when you have sound waves or compressional, compressional disturbances, you have acoustic waves. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say every, dis every variable, every um, 
dependent variable, I'm going to expand it as due to a fluctuation in vorticity, in entropy, and in volume. All right? So in other words, I'm going to say, if I have a vortical fluctuation, so we can measure or compute vorticity, right? In your, you, you're, let's say you're doing a detailed simulation. You compute vorticity at each instant in time. I'm going to say that that vortical fluctuation is fundamentally due to a vortical fluctuation due to a compressional disturbance. That's what that, whatever it was, that a capital lambda. Due to an entropy disturbance and due to a vortical disturbance. All right. So I have these these root these these it's like these canonical disturbances which I don't have access to I can't see them but they're manifesting manifesting themselves as disturbances in pressure and density and temperature and vorticity and entropy and anything else right that I'm actually measuring. Similarly, I can decompose the entropy fluctuation that. A fluctuation in volume will introduce an entropy fluctuation. A fluctuation in entropy will obviously introduce an entropy fluctuation. And a vortical fluctuation will introduce an entropy fluctuation. In the same way, the pressure, you measure the pressure, right? If I take a microphone and I measure it, I can measure fluctuations in pressure due to vortical disturbances, entropy disturbances, and vorticity disturbances. And I've stopped with these three, but you can you can write a similar thing for T1, and I'll show you later for row one, for all the other variables. Okay, does anyone have a question? I want to make sure you're on board with what I'm doing here. Because what I'm going to show you is, is that it's, and I'm going to actually show you data, that in order to interpret a lot of phenomenon, it's, it's, this is a natural way to think about it. For example, the velocity. I, I don't have the velocity here, but if you decompose the velocity in this way, I'll show you velocity data where you'll scratch your head if you, didn't, if you didn't realize this. But if you realize, oh, actually, I have acoustic waves bouncing around, and I have vortical disturbances. They're both introducing flow disturbances, and I'm measuring their superposition. That, that's what's happening. All right? So what I can do then is the, the, I've, I've linearized my Navier-Stokes equations. Yes, ma'am? Uh, that's a good question. Um, if we have disturbances in velocity, uh, if we have disturbances in velocity, yes. can we still assume that they are small in comparison to their mean? Yeah, what actually turns out is um, the uh, uh, you, if, if you if you appropriately non-dimensionalize, you, you can, um, and because it's it, the, the reference velocity scale is not necessarily the mean velocity. For example, even if you have no mean flow, the reference velocity would actually turn out to be the speed of sound. So, what do we compose is according to the reference velocity, it's not the mean velocity. The the appropriate I I'm I'm being a little bit sloppy, and I haven't normalized these to show you the appropriate normalization. But if there's no mean flow, the appropriate way to normalize the wave equation is to normalize by the sound speed. So as long as the fluctuation velocity is small relative to the speed of sound. Yep. But it turns out that, uh, in, in fact, oftentimes in acoustics, we neglect flow altogether because of low Mach number flows. Mean flow has almost no effect on the sound waves. Uh, but but uh, mean flow has a very profound effect on vortical and entropy disturbances. And even if the Mach number is really small, assuming it's zero, it gets you into big trouble. So you can, you can actually make these, you're, you're in, in fact, you're not being, so the appropriate velocity to normalize, the appropriate reference velocity for the acoustic disturbance and the vortical disturbance is actually a different appropriate reference velocity. Yes, sir? So is this kind of taking the place of like a turbulence model? Or how would you take that into consideration in addition to this? If you wanted to do a turbulence model, um, well, it actually, it turns out that turbulence is basically this term. Well, let me hold that for a minute, but, it, but turbulence is basically a model for this term right here. This is, this is more general. In, in, what I'm doing is, if you're, if, you're, if you're coming from a background of incompressible Navier-Stokes turbulence, uh, you have fluctuations in vorticity. And that whole field, you can boil it down to and trying to understand the dynamics of this term right here, fluctuations in vorticity. More generally, when you have chemically reacting compressible vortical flows, you don't just have vortical disturbances like you do in, in turbulence, but you also have entropy <coughs> disturbances and you also have volumetric di dilatational disturbances. Somebody else? Yes? In the equation, uh, shouldn't it be an inequality? The entropy perturbation equation? Um, it, because I've neglected molecular transport terms, those are all the source terms on the right side, and I, I don't. 
So in general, the entropy equation is a complicated equation with lots of source terms. Um, and I've neglected all those source terms. Okay, so the so I have these equations. Um, these are linear equations for vorticity, entropy, and volume or acoustics. And uh, what I can do then is I can take this decomposition, I can plop it into these equations, and I can break them out as equations separately for the vortical disturbance, the entropy disturbance, the acoustic disturbance. <coughs> and so that's what I'm going to do here. And so what I'm, again, I'm going to jump ahead and I'm just going to show you the answer because a lot of stuff cleans up, all right? And I want to, I'm going to, see, I have three separate slides where I'm going to talk about what happens because of a, if I have a vortic, if I have this fundamental vortical disturbance, which I'm, how does that manifest itself? Then I'm going to talk about if I have this fundamental volumetric disturbance, how does that manifest itself and so forth, okay? And so what I've shown here is, is first this equation, um, is that Fluctuations in vorticity due to the vorticity mode. It's the same. It's the exact same equation as we have here. All right. So the, that's that's no surprises. And in fact, fluctuations in velocity due to the vorticity equation. It also satisfies just a, convec a simple convection equation. But what I want to show you here is this. So let's think about what this means. This is p sub one omega is equal to zero. So let's unpack that for a minute. What that says is if I have a vortical disturbance, it introduces a pressure fluctuation. Uh, what this equation says is vortical disturbances don't cause pressure fluctuations. All right? This says vortical disturbances in a homogeneous flow oops, <coughs> don't cause entropy fluctuations. So if I, have a, if I have a weak vortex propagating through, it doesn't change the entropy of the fluid. This equation says if I have a vortical disturbance, it doesn't create a temperature fluctuation. The temperature stays constant. This says, if I have a vortical disturbance, it doesn't change the density. Basically, it's an incompressible disturbance. All right? Um, and so what this tells you then is, and by the way, look, actually, well, let me come back to my question. So what this tells you then is that I, if I fundamentally have this vortical disturbance, vortical disturbances propagate by convection. That's the only way they get around. So you can't turn off mean flow effects, is what, what I was saying for acoustics. The only way a vortical disturbance is going to get from point A to point B is if you pick it up and carry it there by the flow. All right, the flow picks it up and carries it there. Um, and that's what this equation here, and that's the, what this equation here says. What this also says is if I have these vortical disturbances, they cause the flow to oscillate. They cause measurable, if you had a hot wire, if you have PIB, you can measure these flow fluctuations introduced by vortical disturbances, and we measure them all the time. Um, uh, but it also, very interestingly, what it shows you is that this vortical disturbance doesn't cause any disturbances in thermodynamic variables. And this goes back to the fact that a vortical disturbance is incompressible. A fluctuation in vorticity is a rotational disturbance, but it doesn't cause any compressibility, any, any compression of, of the fluid. Yes, sir? Doesn't, doesn't Krakow's theorem require that vorticity generates entropy that way, though? But is, that, is it because they're okay. small? Uh, realize that I've assumed homogeneous flow, all right? So you have to have gradients, right, across, across streamlines. That's what Krakow's theorem. It talks about gradients across streamlines. So a crucial assumption that, I'm, that I've made here is that I have a homogeneous flow. So this is my background, which I'm going to use to introduce this decomposition. Then I'll talk about what happens if I have real inhomogeneous flows. And then that adds new physics. Um, yeah, good question. Let me ask you a question. If I were to um, stand at the back of a jet engine would I hear it? There's a lot of vorticity coming out of the back end of a jet engine. And it would really make my ears hurt, right? And, and what's making my ears hurt? It's fluctuations in pressure. So what's, how are those, rec how can I reconcile those observations? Did you guys see the question? I'll, I'll pose it another way. If, if you were to take a, uh, if I was to take a, a, go to your air compressor at home and hit, the nozzle to make air come out, you hear it, right? And if you were to put a microphone in the flow, you'd really hear it. So that is sound. Sound you hear because of pressure. But this equation says that vortical disturbances don't make pressure fluctuations. How many of you ever have you ever any of you ever heard of Lyell's equation? Lyell's equation is an equation that tells you how fluid mechanic flow fluctuations make sound. So the answer to that is, is that 
the key is that this is P1. The, um, the to first order in disturbance fluctuation, vorticity doesn't make sound. Turns out the second order, if I were to include higher order disturbances, vortical fluctuations do make sound. It's proportional to the square. All right. So so if I had what I would if I expanded if I continue my expansion, I have P naught and P one. If I added a P two term, a second order order epsilon squared term, then you would see that these modes of vortical disturbances do excite pressure fluctuation. Okay, in the same way, vertical fluctuations would excite entropy and temperature and density disturbances. Okay, anyway, so what I've, what I've shown you here is that we have fluctuations in vorticity and they just convect along and they create no fluctuations in thermodynamic variables. Let's talk about the acoustics now. Um, here I wrote the same. Again, I've just, I've written, so everything here is going to have a subscript lambda. And first of all, you can see that the fluctuating pressure, again, satisfies that same equation. Or without, uh, without, uh, in, for a low Mach number flow, that equation simplifies to this, this equation that I have here. And and uh, so, and, and remember, I, I let me just say again that in order to understand vorticity disturbances, you got to have mean flow, because that's the only way without molecular transport that stuff gets from point A to point B. Sound waves don't need flow to go from point A to point B, right? I'm not physically walking up to every one of your ears and shouting in your ear for you to hear me, right? Sound has this. It propagates without physical flow convection. Flow convection helps, but in a low Mach number flow, that convective process is totally negative flow. We can pretty much ignore it. Um, but what this tells you is pressure disturbances obey a totally different equation than the vortical disturbance. The vortical disturbance is a convective, unsteady convection equation. This is a wave equation. All right, this is a wave equation. It describes the propagation of dilatational disturbances. Acoustic waves are intrinsically dilatational disturbances, they're fluctuations in volume. Um, okay, what does this equation say? This says that the fluctuation in vorticity due to acoustic oscillations is zero. All right, so what does that say? It says that when I'm talking, as sound is going zipping through the air to you, it's not creating vortical fluctuations. But the air, if the air starts out irrotational, it stays irrotational. This equation right here says it's also not making entropy is that as sound is propagating through the air, the, the entropy just stays to whatever it is. All right? OK, what does this equation say? This says rho sub lambda is equal to P, P1 over C squared. This says, this goes back to this dilatational part. It says that when I have these acoustic waves, these pressure fluctuations are, mani are, are, um, are also manifested as fluctuations in density or fluctuations in volume of the flow. So the volume of the fluid is oscillating. This says right here that the temperature is also oscillating temperature of the fluid. So very, very small. But as I'm talking, as the sound wave is going zipping from me to you, the temperature of the air is actually bouncing up and down very slightly. Um, and what this equation says right here is, is that these acoustic disturbances cause flow fluctuation. So I, in the same way, the, the air molecules are bouncing back and forth a little bit. Um, they're, they're, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a disturbance in flow velocity because of the pressure gradient. When you have acoustic waves, you create an oscillatory pressure gradient. This, this equation is just F equals ma. You have an oscillatory pressure gradient, you have oscillatory acceleration of the fluid. All right? Um, so some interesting things. You can see that, the, that fundamentally there's this wave equation which describes acoustic disturbances. But it also tells you that the density, pressure, and temperature are locally and algebraically related by their isotropic relations. By the way, what time are we supposed to break? So why don't we take a stand up jumping jacks break real quick because I'm getting some, some nonverbal cues from my audience. You guys can all stand up for a couple minutes here.